a Romanian film. I consider myself a rather big fan of silent movies. My father had a couple of reels of old, grimy, yet still elegant productions, like Phantom of the Opera, Greed, and The Cat and the Canary. Every couple of months or so, me and the rest of my family would all sit down and watch one of them with their old projector as a nice, relaxed movie night. They were always very fun, and many of my core memories center on those nights. The scream of terror I had when the Phantom's true face was shown. The happiness when the menacing cat was first arrested. The initial confusion of attempting to follow many of these plot lines and misplaced joy and anger as I followed the story my juvenile mind created as I watched. As I have grown up, I have taken other interests and hobbies, but my love for classical silent era films have never gone away. I have made friends who collect film reels, just like my father. I have touched, held, and seen incredibly rare movies that, if listed online, would easily go for hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. I preface this story with all the background because it is integral to how I have come across something so bizarre. A few months back, one of my friends gave me a contact of his in Europe, Serbia specifically, and told me that he had a film that he said I would be fascinated by which also happened to be something he'd be glad to loan off himself for 200 Serbian dinars. Interested, I asked and received his contact information, and later that day I sent him an email introducing myself and inquiring about the movie, asking basic facts about when it was made and if any other copies had surfaced. His response confirmed the film was as prophesied by my acquaintance. In slightly broken yet understandable English, he claimed the movie was filmed all the way back in 1907 and was of a Romanian origin, also noting that he had not seen the film listed anywhere else, which indicated it had not only been lost but was so obscure absolutely nobody even knew of its existence besides me, him, and his family, along with anyone else he happened to tell about it. According to him, his grandfather had bought it off a wandering salesman near the Serbian-Romanian border. He never spoke much about it, but the seller recalled his father telling him to watch out for roaming fences, citing that he himself had seen a man without a tongue babbling about some movie trying to sell it. It had been kept in the family ever since, although he couldn't say whether or not he had ever watched it at all, and he certainly knew he never did, because he would either not want to sell it, or there wouldn't even be a film to sell. He remembered his father telling him about how it was about some man meeting a demon, but the details were fuzzy in his head and he couldn't remember entirely. The name of the movie, Omagu Diavovuli, or Homage for the Devil, in Romanian, certainly supported this. With my interest piqued, I wired him the payment. He sent me one more email thanking me profusely, in retrospect, I should have seen the warning signs, starting here. It was three entire pages of the phrase, Thank you, thank you so much, repeated over, and over, and over, again. And then a few more weeks later, a package arrived in the mail. Opening it up, it was a dusty, oxidized movie reel with the film wrapped around the center. I took out my old projector and screen, and carefully inserted the reel, turning it on and starting the movie. I had a strange uneasiness as I watched the film move. It started with just a black screen for a couple of minutes, before coming to an establishing shot of the small town. The picture clarity was unnaturally high for a movie so old, and it was clear that the town wasn't a model, nor a set, but a real one. People moved in and out of shops and restaurants and talked to each other on the pathways. Horses were seen carrying cargo on the cobblestone roads. After a couple of minutes of this shot, it cuts to a balding man writing something in a study of some sort. The room is dingy and dark, the only light being from a couple of candles at the table where the man is sat down. He's wearing a disheveled suit with a plaid shirt and his pants half holes and cut off just around his ankles. I can't see his shoes, but I can infer that they are in similar bad condition. 
After a few minutes or so of just writing, he gets up and walks to the door, opens it and walks through. We cut to another room, very small and connecting to some sort of dining room. There's a bed at the back where we see an emaciated woman and a young girl lying. The girl has black hair, while the woman wears a nightcap. Both wear white gowns and are under blankets that cover their lower bodies. The girl sways back and forth a bit, and seemingly tries to keep away from the woman on her right, who is perfectly still, almost like a corpse. When the camera cuts again, it answers why. It's a close-up of the woman, who stares directly ahead with large, unnaturally wide open eyes. Her pupils look like that of a goat's, a long, thick, horizontal line going across the eye, west to east. Notably, there is a dent in her forehead. Not a hole, a dent. As if her head was metal and a hammer had been taken to it like a nail. It cuts again, and the man is walking out of the house. He walks along the road, the camera cutting to show his walk in entirety, from all different sorts of angles, across the street from a second story of a building, right in front of him, etc. He walks inside a building along the way, and it cuts again. The man is now in an office, pleading with what seems to be some sort of an executive of a company, an old fat man in a suit and beard. The man starts off the conversation quite normally, but as it goes on, he increasingly gets more and more unhinged. He starts screaming acting out exaggerated gestures and appearing to shed real tears by the end of his tirade. The fat man just laughs in his face as a response, and in return the man slaps him across the face and storms off in anger. It cuts again. After what appears to be some time later, the man stands before an altar in a similarly dark room as before, a jagged dagger in one hand and a thick book in the other. He places the book on the altar and lifts his free hand above it, brandishing his dagger as if to slice his palm and rain the book in blood. The spine of the book had a cross on it, indicating it is a Bible. The man's demeanor is also quite off. His face cannot be seen, but his dagger hand is shaking. He turns it over in his hand constantly, as if he is anxious and afraid. After a minute or so of deliberation, his free hand wraps around the blade. It cuts without showing the slash, and the man is seen with a bandage on his hand. He is standing before a leg, appearing to wait for someone. It is obviously night, the only light being from the candles seemingly provided by the film crew, and half the moon reflecting off the surface of the leg. After a couple of minutes, the movie abruptly cuts to black before cutting again to the lake scene with one huge difference. A horrifying creature now stands before the man, almost looking like it hovers above the lake. The abomination carries a human figure, a terrifyingly skinny one with long and spiddly arms and legs. Despite the black and white nature of the movie, I can certainly deduce that the creature is pale, glowing in the night, almost fluorescently. There's a mane of dark feathers around its neck, going down its back and its face. Oh goodness, its face. It's an ugly, wrinkled, inhumane mess punctuated by a large nose that appears almost like a pig snout, and huge bulging eyes with bloodshot vessels you could see from miles away. Around it, tendril-like limbs sprout and orbit the thing loose flesh and fibers flowing in the apparent wind. There is no conception in my mind as to how these most likely dirt-poor Romanians were able to construct such a lifelike, complex organic prop, or even a costume, in 1907. The most likely thing is that they didn't. The entity reaches out to the man. It stares at the man for a second, and before it cuts away, I swear I can see it move towards him, if only just for a millisecond. The next shot is back in the bedroom with the woman and girl. This time the man is standing before them in his own nightgown. His expression is lifeless, one of despair. It cuts to black again for a few seconds and the creature appears again, tendrils flowing and everything. 
It reaches a lanky arm out to the man, and his attention is grabbed. He then just stares at it for a second before the film cuts to black again, and goes back to the scene for a final time. The creature is gone. The man is still standing at where the creature was and abruptly starts walking out, ending the scene. The next scene is not for the faint of heart, so I will spare the gory details and give a brief summary. The man walks into the altar room with a small bundled thing. The camera starts to zoom in from afar on a particular part of the bundle. The man slowly turns it, and it reveals a screaming, bawling baby. The camera zooms out again, and the man tries to shush it to no avail. Finally, he takes the dagger out again, pointing the blade at the baby. The next scene is the man returning home, and the scene is disproportionately happy compared to the horrors in the last one. The woman, his apparent wife, greets him at the door with a hug and a kiss while the girl who appears to be his daughter jumps into his arms. His wife's head notably doesn't have the dent anymore. The man himself has an odd air about him. His beaming smile and jubilant attitude are infected by his shame and dread, something that's not immediately noticeable but can be easily seen once you do. His eyes are shifty, and the hand he held the dagger in shakes just a little bit, enough to be noticeable. The scene fades, doesn't cut, into the next scene. The camera fades into the same bedroom the wife and daughter were in, except the man is laid there instead. All of the furnishings and such are taken out of the room, leaving such a plain white room with the bed. The man coughs and turns around in the bed in agony. His bald head shines with sweat from his sickness, and he is clearly in a lot of real pain. Just when the man is laid still, the scene appears to have run its course. A sudden pentagram appears on his chest. The lines of the star and circle burst into flames, igniting the man in the blanket. Soon everything is on fire. The man can't be seen very well, but I can only imagine how fast he burns into a human puddle. It is a clear repentance for his previous deal and sin. The last scene is a small funeral for the dead man. The coffin is already in the grave and the gravedigger is on standby for when it is over. Only one figure is shown up and it's not the man's wife, nor his kid. It is a tall figure whose face cannot be seen due to the wide-brimmed hat it's wearing. A priest comes into the frame with a Bible, quickly giving the man his last rites before leaving. The tall figure steps forward slowly and offers a single unknown flower before the camera cuts to a back shot of the figure walking away. As the figure takes its hat off, I audibly gasp as it reveals two large, dark horns as it walks away. The movie ends with no credits. I have no idea what to make of this movie. It is bizarre in a way I cannot hope to be seen replicated anywhere else. The frantic editing tells me it's a movie, but the lack of set designs and appearance of real emotion, and the entity tells me it is not. I am so bewildered and confused. I fear I have stumbled across something that no man was ever supposed to see, and I hope this does not make its way out of my possession. The knowledge of its existence and contents within could paint a target on my back and lead to the destruction of my life and potentially the backbone of many others' lives. Ever since I saw it on that fateful day around three months ago, there's been an aura around my house I cannot shake, like something is always watching me, observing me, and it follows me everywhere I go around the house. Whether or not it's the effects of the movie taking its toll on my mind, even all this time later, or if it's something more than just paranoia, I'm not so sure. Considering the nature of the things I saw in the film, I cannot rule out the possibility that some spirit or remnant of the man, entity, or someone else followed me all the way from Serbia, latched onto the film like a postal stamp to finally greet me once I exposed my eyes to that wretched tape. In spite of everything, I have but one question. If the devil was only at the funeral, what in the heck was that thing that the man saw?
This was back in the late 90s, when myself and two of my friends were staying at their vacation home down on one of the local rivers. The house, think three small bedrooms, a setting room slash kitchen, and a small external bathroom, is on a privately owned island, not theirs, which is used for cattle grazing, and is about three to four square miles in area. It is accessible by only one dirt road, which takes all of about 30 minutes to travel down, as it bends and winds through dense cypress swamps that are full of alligators and marsh plains. Along the road, there is one other house, just as you get onto the island, which has long been abandoned. This old two-story plantation-style home was supposedly abandoned when the owners, a married couple child, suffered from a fatal accident, and they couldn't stand being there anymore. Aside from my friend's house, the cattle farmer's home, and one other vacation home, the abandoned property is the only other structure. Well, my friends and I were out on the dock doing some night fishing, trying to land a shark or something to throw on the grill, but we hadn't had much luck. The river was as smooth as glass, which was really unusual because of where the dock is. The current there is usually very strong, even during the tide shift. We sat and chatted, waiting for a bite, up until about 11 p.m., then off to our right, towards the coast. We heard a loud tone, or wail, which sounded like a mix between a ship's horn and maybe a wolf howl or something similar. An important note, the island is nearly an hour by car from deep water access, and probably more from actual ocean, so the likelihood that the sound was a large ship is low. So anyway, we were startled by the sound, and even my friend who had been spending his summers there since he was in diapers, had never heard the noise before, and was bothered by it. So we decided to pack it in, since we weren't catching anything anyway and had nearly gotten all of our equipment back to the house when my second friend heard it. Coming from down the road, back towards the island access, was what sounded either like a cat meowing or a child crying. We all stood in silence listening and trying to figure out what it was and where it was coming from. After listening for about five minutes, we decide to hop back in the truck and drive down the road a ways, with the windows down, so we can try and find what was making that sound. What started out sounding like a cat was made clear as we got further up the road. That was not the case. We could clearly hear a child, and it sounded like it was saying, help me. We drove very slowly calling out, and we'd wait a few minutes, and hear, help me again, but always further up the road towards the swamps and the old abandoned house. We were seriously freaked out, because if there was a kid out there, why would they be going away from our calls and right into the swamp? We nearly made it all the way to the abandoned house when the sound just stopped. We waited for nearly an hour and never heard it again. We marked it up as nerves and headed back to the river house, assuming it had been an animal after all, and that we were probably just imagining it saying words. Well, after we'd gotten back inside and settled in for the night, we started hearing it again but as time passed, it came closer to us. We went out and called out again, and the sound would come closer. This went on for hours. Well, we decided we would try one more time to see if there was a kid lost or something. Again, important to note, we are miles from the next nearest people, and the noise sounded like a child. Think four-year-old. But once we got out in the truck again, the noise stopped. It was now nearly three in the morning, and we had been out in the sun fishing and swimming all day, so we were all tired, and after driving around for a bit, calling out again with no luck, we decided to give up. We get back inside again and get into our beds. Then we hear it, clear as a bell, help me, right outside the house. But it sounded so strange, like it was an echo if that makes sense. Like it was close, but far away too and like hell if any of us were brave enough to go commando and leave the house. But we went out onto the porch, which was screened in for bugs, and listened. As soon as we went out, it would stop. Go back into the beds. It would call out again, but in a different location outside the house. It circled the house, calling all night. We all slept in the living room, but to be honest, there wasn't a lot of sleeping happening. In the morning, we went out and looked for tracks around the house, 
as the foundation is basically sand. There wasn't a mark, no prints, animal or otherwise, and to the best of my knowledge, this never happened again to my friend or any other visitors. To this day, we don't know what we heard, but it's probably the most supernatural occurrence that I've ever experienced. Greetings, Entropic Society. Here is the story that you have requested. Let's get started, shall we? The story is entitled, Candle Walker, written by Shadow Scribe. The room was dark and empty, a spare room that I hadn't had the chance to do anything with. The electricity had gone out sometime earlier that night, so I had no way to tell time and no source of light except for the flashlight in my hand, my lighter, and the candle I had brought just in case. I was sitting with my back in the far corner of the room, flashlight pointed straight at the door on the other side of the room. The beam of light danced on the wall across from me as my hand shook, terrified, although I had no idea what had been stalking me that day. It started as I was coming back to the old house from the store. I didn't have a care, so I biked, carrying my groceries in two plastic bags in a crate hooked up to the rear of my bike. When I got home, I noticed that I was missing a bag of groceries. It must have fallen off when I was riding home. Thinking it nothing more than unfortunate luck, I picked up the one bag and headed inside. After all, I could do without canned goods for a few days. I opened the door and almost immediately tripped on something piled in a heap at the foot of my door just inside the house. The groceries from the bag I was holding flew into the air and scattered as it hit the ground. When I looked back to see what had tripped me, there was a sloppy pile of canned food. Since I never locked my door, I simply dismissed it as a good Samaritan act from someone who lived in the area and was too shy to introduce themselves. I picked up all the food and stowed it away in the kitchen. It was getting to be about nighttime, so I headed upstairs to my bedroom, got a good book, flipped the switch on the bedside lamp, and entrenched myself in a good story. As the night went on, I started to hear weird noises coming from downstairs in the kitchen. I told myself it was just my imagination, because every time I would notice the sounds, they would stop. And when I went back to the story, they would pick up again. My imagination would do that to me from time to time. Before I was able to finish my chapter, the lamplight flickered out. I put my book down, still open, and pages down to save my spot and went to turn on the main light. Unfortunately, it didn't come on either. The power was out. As I tried to remember where the circuit breaker was, the noises from downstairs resumed. It sounded like someone rummaging around my kitchen. I grabbed a flashlight from the nightstand drawer, a bat from underneath my bed, and headed downstairs, each of the steps creaking on my way down. When I got to the kitchen, the noises stopped. Bat ready, I pointed my flashlight all around to see where the intruder was, but saw no one. What I did see was the canned food I had recently put away was stacked neatly in a pyramid fashion just beneath the kitchen table. I swallowed hard, thinking that someone was either playing some prank or some sick, twisted game. Slowly, I crept towards the table, feet wet from orange juice and milk that had been spilled on the floor. When I got close to the table, I could hear breathing coming from beneath it. I stooped down to look, but saw nothing. Slowly, I reached out to touch the pyramid of cans. As soon as my hand made contact, the cans scattered. It was as if something burst through them, scattering them in all directions. I fell back onto the soaked floor and dropped the flashlight. As I frantically grasped for the light, I heard the sound of feet splashing through the puddles on the floor and run out of my kitchen. I got up and slowly followed the footprints made of the juice and milk mixture. What struck me as odd was that they weren't human footprints. They were the same width and length, but 
the toes were much longer, almost as long as fingers. I followed them towards the front door where they disappeared. I relaxed a little, just thankful that whatever it was, was gone. But I didn't loosen my grip on the bat. Slowly, I walked backwards towards the stairs again, planning on locking myself up in my room and waiting till morning. As I did, it sounded like something wet hit the wooden floor in front of me. I pointed my flashlight down at the floor and my heart stopped. There was a new footprint. This one pointed at me. I took another step back. Another wet slap. Another footprint. I turned and ran, tripping up the stairs but making it up to my room. I slammed the door shut, locked it, and pushed the bed up against it, knocking my book down in the process. I set the bat down on the bed for a second and grabbed a lighter and candle out of my nightstand, just in case I would need it. That's when I heard the first squeak. Whatever it was, it was mounting the first step in the staircase. Frantically, I ran to the opposite side of the room, where there was a door that led to a spare room. Upon hearing the second step creak, I threw open the door, which didn't have a lock, ran inside, and headed to the far corner. I sat there quietly breathing heavily, heart pounding in my ears. I realized that I left my bat on the bed, but was convinced by the creaking of the third and fourth step that it wasn't worth going out to get it. And as I sat there, counting the steps as they creaked, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, it was getting closer. My hand shook as a tear ran down my cheek. What was going on? 15, 16, 17. I tried to control my breathing. After all, I was trying not to be found. 19, 20, 21. My heart pounded louder, sweat flattened my hair to my head, and the shaking became worse. 22, 23, 24. My knuckles were white as I clenched the flashlight whose beam was now dancing all over the wall and rarely landing on the door. 25. It had reached the second floor. Slowly, the footsteps got closer as it approached my room. I heard the lock turn, the door creak open, and the bed scrape across the floor. I heard the bat rattle against the wood as it fell off the bed, and still, the footsteps continued. Pages turned as whatever it was picked up my book and looked through it. Then came a thud as it dropped it. It began to rummage through my drawers and my sheets, as if looking for something. Then everything went still and quiet. The silence was only broken by my quiet sobs and heavy breathing and the pounding of my heart. It stayed like this for what seemed like a few minutes and the footsteps continued, closing the distance between it and the spare room. The door slowly creaked open, lingering ajar momentarily. My heart was ready to leap out of my chest. My mouth was dry, and sweat stuck my clothes to my skin. This was it, I thought. As I waited for something to come into the room, nothing happened. Again came the excruciating silence, this time lasting for what felt like hours and hours on end. Nothing happened, and I was starting to believe that whatever it was had lost interest and left. Still, I sat in my corner, flashlight trained on the door opposite of me, slowly returning to a calmer state of mind. After God knows how long, My flashlight flickered out, leaving me in complete darkness. Frantically, I reached for the lighter and flicked it on. My gaze shot towards the door. Still, nothing. I looked around the room. Nothing. Slowly, I got up and crossed the room to the door. 
I closed it and sat with my back against it just in case. Still, the silence reigned. Finally, I let out a sigh of relief. It was gone. I went to flip the light switch, but still the power was out. So, I lit the candle instead. And that's when I became aware of something standing in the opposite corner of the room. My heart froze in my chest, and my lungs refused to work. It hadn't been there before, but it was now. In a frenzy to get up and run, I had knocked the candle over and it went out. I gripped the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. I was stuck, locked inside with God knows what. I searched the floor for the lighter and flicked it on. I looked around, but the being was gone. Again, I was alone, breathing heavily. I found the candle, all the while keeping my gaze on the far corner where it had been just moments before. Once I brought the lighter to the wick and life was breathed into the candle, it reappeared in the far corner, exactly as it had before. The candle gave it away. The first thing I noticed were its feet, flat, long, and bony. Its body was built the same way, abnormally skinny like a Holocaust victim, just skin wrapped in bone. It was short too, like a child. It only came up to my waist, if that. Its knobbly arms were just long enough that its long, skinny fingers reached the ground as it stood straight up. It wore the remains of a tattered old gray cloak draped over its shoulders. Its face was something that is beyond words to describe. As best I can, it was bald, pale, and had no ears or nose that I could see. The mouth was thin and lacked proportion, much like the rest of its body. And the eyes? The eyes were round and lifeless, black orbs that simply reflected the candlelight. As I stared at it, its eyes seemed to calm me down. My heart rate slowed, my breathing steadied, and the urge to run faded away. Something about its eyes kept me gazing into them, unable to move, not wanting to if I could. I began to realize that it had followed me for quite some time, not just since the grocery store, but it had been there when I was a child, watching me, waiting for me. It had followed me since then, and it had a purpose for me. I could feel its gaze drawing me in, helping me realize that I belonged with it. It stepped forward slowly putting one foot in front of the other, dragging its fingers across the ground. It came right up next to me, its gaze never leaving mine. As I stared down at it and it up at me, it slowly raised one arm, holding out its long, thin hand. Its fingers were about twice the size of mine, and I knew that normally this would be something to be afraid of, but... As I gazed into the light reflected off its eyes, I began to forget my name, my past, and myself. I took its hand and it patted my hand with its other hand. It took the candle and led me out the door, down the stairs, and out into the yard. Together we walked down the street and up to the forest, the candle lighting our path. I stopped at the edge of the woods and looked back at the city. The creature tugged on my arm, insisting that I follow. I looked into its eyes and all of the worries were gone. Somehow, I knew I had to hurry, because the others were waiting. I was not the first one he had found, nor would I be the last. I was going to join the others. I kept on walking, following the path that it led me down, lit by a mixture of candle and moonlight. As we strode, the wind picked up and the candle was blown out. It dropped to the forest floor with a thud. 
I looked around frantically for my guide, but it had disappeared. Still, there was the grip on my hand, pulling me down the path lit by the moonlight. I would never be seen again. Shadows in the Ice Written by Band and CP I think it's been 16 days since we first arrived, eager to spend two weeks away from civilization, to get back to our roots. We'd come, Earl, Mason, Ricky, and I, from the town of Andery, Manitoba, where the four of us attended university, myself passionately studying English, though for what ends, I never knew. Earl, I had known since we were both young, both of us hailing from Maysburg, Tennessee, and riding on full scholarships, such a close companion helping me to abate the loneliness that comes with traversing to a faraway place. We did not befriend Ricky and Mason, however, until our sophomore year, both of whom were from the local area. It became soon apparent afterward that we all shared a passion for the hunt. It was for this reason that we decided to take up on the advertisement Earl had found online to rent out this cabin in the remotes of Saskatchewan for two weeks before heading back home for Christmas. It seemed like the perfect getaway that we'd all been looking for, the chance to feel alive and masculine. The advertisement explicitly stated that the cabin had absolutely none of the modern luxuries the modern world provided us. Electricity, central heating, internet, or even any kind of reception due to its isolation. The perfect vacation. We reached out to the one who posted this opportunity, an old woman who summered here with her husband for a few weeks in June. The price was fair and we all chipped in to cover the costs. When winter break finally came, we gathered our food, guns and beer to make the long excursion into the prospecting wilderness. The first night we unpacked and relaxed around the fireplace with our ample supply of Labatt Blue, planning out the activities for the next two weeks. We planned on hunting, of course, though Mason was a little worried about us being discovered by authorities, as we had not been able to purchase hunting licenses due to not being official residents of Saskatchewan. However, we all assured him that there is nobody for miles, and that there is absolutely nothing to be worried about. The next day did not go according to plan, though not to our displeasure. Instead of searching for small game, we decided to instead drink a copious amount of Labatt Blue and eggnog, not the kind you give small children, with not so legal herbal substances for dessert. We made a point to ourselves to make as much noise as humanly possible, celebrating the end of the grueling semester. Needless to say, we passed out in a drunken stupor, our positions more embarrassing than I'd like to admit. We awoke the next morning to find ourselves shivering and having eaten more than two days worth of food. Ricky, who was comparable in size to an elephant, was the main culprit for this. As he had dressed up as Santa Claus and decided to be the food Santa, which in his intoxicated mind meant to eat everything he could get his hands on. At some point, we managed to shake our hangovers enough to put on our boots and coats and set out in the early afternoon to try to shoot some rabbit and squirrel. We worked superbly as a team and bagged about four rabbits, three squirrels, and five birds before nightfall. We all figured that if we were breaking the law to begin with, that we might as well go all the way. And it felt good, too. We felt primal in those frigid woods. We set out earlier the next day, though. We had a little less luck than the previous night, as we killed about the same amount as the previous afternoon, though over the entire day instead of a few hours. However, it was not until the following day that we became really excited about our excursions. For after bagging more small game, we came across elk tracks at the northern border of the woods, about three miles away from the cabin. We followed them into a spacious, snow-blanketed plains, and found a lone calf crying by itself. Shh, I hissed as I crouched down and steadied my rifle. Heck, you ain't gonna kill that cute little baby, are you? Mason asked. I raised my hand to silence him. Tuck. 
I fired the gun, the bullet piercing through the calf's hind leg. It shrieked and I fired thrice more, finally bringing the beast down. You were saying? I teased. Well, heck. I was gonna say we ought to leave him, but I guess it's too late now. We all chuckled and swiftly snuck over to make sure that it was dead. Sure enough, I'd knocked its lights out. Yet it was then that Ricky pointed at the sky. Look, he said while scratching his enormous belly. Northern Lights. We all looked up and sure enough the sky was beginning to glow with a deep green hue, the pattern slowly trawling over the starlit sky, while red flickered sparingly like splashes of blood. Looks like a Christmas tree, huh? Mason admired. Been a while since I've seen any of those. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, Earl grumbled. Now let's get this bad boy back to the cabin. We tied up the calf and carried it back, though we said little. I'm not sure if the others could sense it, but I had the feeling that we were being watched by something lurking in the shadows. Despite this, we made the trip back without incident, while the red and green sky lit the snow beneath our boots. We were correct as about a mile and a half away where it shot the calf, we found a handful of very large elk shambling along the next day, occasionally nibbling at the frozen ground. All of us say Mason killed one though we only brought one back. We partied again the next day following that to celebrate our victory and also to take a break from the hunt with Ricky, much to my horror pretending again to be the food Santa and demolishing any food inside. At some point, Ricky disappeared only to come back with a pine tree that surprisingly fit well within the living room, for which we fashioned a star out of a cut up eggnog container and hung bottle caps and miscellaneous objects from it using fishing line that we'd found in the closet. Besides that though, there was little incident, and once again we passed out unevenly across the cabin. Yet that night I could not seem to keep my eyes away from the windows, as though something was subconsciously calling my attention. Earl, I also noticed, seemed to be eyeing the windows too, though we never mentioned this phenomenon to one another. We ignored our hangovers when we awoke, our primal enthusiasm having been renewed by our day's break, and we set out to the northern plains again, eager to find the elk. We found them about two miles away where they'd been before, now northeast of the cabin. All right, I murmured to Mason. Since you haven't gotten one yet, you get to go first. Careful though, ain't that many left. Be easy for him to slip off. Mason nodded and slid to his belly, peering down the scope through the bushes we hid behind. The shot missed and they all scattered to the trees before Mason had a chance to fire again. Dang, he cried. You goof, now we gotta track them all down again. I yelled with a kick of snow onto his back. He brushed it off and stood up. We already killed three of them, Tuck. Earl threw his hands up. Well crap, I wanna kill some more. Hey, Ricky bellowed. Calm her down, eh? We still got plenty of light. Just go give her. I said nothing, but instead began to stomp over to the trees, the vein in my temple pumping. The others followed and we found that elk that had gone south. It was about a mile away when Earl piped up from behind us. Hey, are there wolves in these parts? Yeah, I know there's some timber wolves, Ricky affirmed. Why do you ask? Well, Earl said while closely inspecting the ground. Seems to be what looks like wolf tracks over here, and a big old pile of wolf crap too. I straightened my back and traipsed over to where he stood and inspected it myself. Having hunted them before, I knew immediately that he was correct. You guys want to hunt some wolves? I asked with a sly grin on my face. Aren't they protected or something? Mason quizzed doubtfully. We glared at him and he casted his eyes down in embarrassment. We followed the tracks further south and around the cabin headed east, though night fell on us before we could find the wolves and we decided to head back to the cabin, keeping in mind the location which was a little less than a mile east of the cabin. The next day proved to be colder than usual, bitingly frozen, but we persisted nonetheless and just after an hour and a half came across the remains of small animals. And soon after that, we came across a frozen pond with a large pack fighting over the corpse of a calf. Hey, Earl whispered as we settled behind some brush. I just noticed something. 
What's that? I asked. Earl lowered his voice and cast a weary eye to the predators beyond the trees. I ain't heard any howling these past few days. And they're fighting with each other right now, but they aren't making any noise. I brushed this off though, I could see Mason scratch at his red ears. So, I demanded. All I care about is bagging me a couple of wolves. I could care less if they're quiet. One of the wolves, a small gray runt, who'd been nipping at the heels to get a chance to eat, suddenly perked his ears up and began sniffing in our direction. I held my finger up and readied my rifle. The others followed suit. I fired the first round, killing the runt, and the others followed. We each killed one, despite them having scrambled away in the blink of an eye. Ricky managed to kill what seemed to be the Alpha, a large monstrosity with its muzzle soaked in blood. Holy hot dang, that's a keeper, eh? Ricky coughed. Sure is, pal, Mason praised. Mine's no pipsqueak either, though. Mason looked over at my kill and scoffed. And you were getting your gaunch in a wad over that missed shot, he goaded. Go piss up a rope. Ricky slung his gun over his shoulder and sighed. Shut it, you two. Just bring them back to the cabin. Goodness, it's freezing. I wish I had my Mickey on me. Mason laughed and said, Yeah, you'd love to get pissed, wouldn't you? Heck, you drink the whole 2-4 by yourself. I'd rather you not, Earl grumbled as he stuck a pinch of dip in his mouth. Ate up half a dang shopping mall doing your whole Santa shtick, you fat piece of crap. Ricky playfully gave Earl the finger and grappled the dead wolf by its neck and began heading back the way we came. We all followed suit and that night prepared a meal out of the small game we collected from the days prior. Hey, Ricky bellowed from the kitchen, candles throwing long shadows across the walls. Where's my 2-4? You freaking drank it, remember? I replied as I whittled away at a piece of wood. Already? Yep. Well, crap. Any of you guys mind if I have a beer? Yeah, Mason said with a glance up from a book on Native American mythology. Go ahead. Thanks. We stared in silence at the dying fire for the next hour, each of us lost in thoughts, not speaking until the flames finally died. I guess I'll go and get some more firewood, Earl yawned. He stood up with a stretch and head towards the side door where he put on his winter layers. Half an hour went by before I noticed that he hadn't returned. The freak did he go? I slurred with a glass of eggnog in my hand. Don't know, Ricky remarked. Want me to go check on him? I nodded and finished the glass. Ricky had been outside scarcely two minutes before he came panting back to the doorway. Guys, you better come out here. What is it? Mason asked. Ricky, he's... he's not out there. Saw some blood on the snow and trails leading off into the woods. Grab the guns, too. Mason and I leapt to our feet and grabbed our rifles and coats, racing out to the woodshed where we could see discarded logs and copious amounts of blood, while deep crevices in the snow showed what appeared to have been where he had been struggling and dragged away, though the cascading flurries were already beginning to cover this. We gave little time to take in the scene before we charged off into the woods, following the bloody path. We followed the trail for half an hour before it suddenly ended, with no trace of Earl in sight. The heck is he? I gasped as the cold chewed at my face. Ricky wiped his brow and replied, I don't know, let's just look around and keep looking. We split up with our guns readied, all dreading what we might find. The snow was deep and the wind yelled and yaped. Vaguely, I was aware that, in the sky, blood-red aurora borealis danced. But I paid it no heed, for I was focused on finding my friend. Oh crap, Ricky exclaimed. What is it? He didn't give a reply, though immediately afterwards, I heard Mason curse and gag. Shaking my head, I trotted over to them, and I froze. Lying on the bushes was the naked body of a man, torn and chewed beyond recognition, with the head ripped carelessly from the body. Can't be, Mason whispered. Evan can't be. It's not Earl. The heck do you mean it's not Earl? Ricky demanded. It can't be. It's got to be someone else. I mean, Earl's got to still be out here. Mason, I said. It's him. Who else would it be? But we don't know that. There's no clothes, no head. All right. Well, uh, I'll look for the other parts. 
I said with a pat on his shoulder. I didn't know what else to do. It felt like my stomach had dropped. Then, I found it. Lying in the bushes was a pile of bloodied rags, torn remnants of Earl's attire. Holding my hand over my mouth, I reached out and picked up the rags, only to find Earl's head underneath, broken and misshapen. I could feel my body trying to empty its bladder, though luckily, I held it in. What? Reggie asked, his face paler than the snow. I shook my head and pointed as I stepped away, doubled over in an attempt to keep the rushing nausea at bay. We need to get out of here, Mason whispered. Man, we need to get back to the cabin, right now. I nodded my head and hurried back the way we came, without a moment's thought. The trip back felt quick, and I could feel eyes watching us from the shadows, waiting for the next chance to strike again. But I ignored them, trying to keep the hot image of Earl's head out of my eyelids, while snow pricked at my face. None of us said a word to each other when we got back. We slept fitfully that night, and Ricky awoke us several times from downstairs, where he slept by the fireside. Neither Mason or I blamed him when we would come racing down, just in case the screams were more than nightmares. In the morning, none of us felt eager for breakfast, though we did so out of concern for our health and warmth, as the temperatures were plummeting faster than ever. We discussed what happened and came to the conclusion that there could be only one culprit for the murder of our friend, Wolves. In clear hindsight, it was foolish for us to do so, but we became enraged at this attack, blubbering and foaming at the mouth for retribution, and it was for this reason that we set off into the snow-covered woods that day, for we sought vengeance. There was nothing spectacular to say about the excursion, other than that the tracks and the blood had been completely covered by the snow, though we could feel a tension in the air, prickling at the back of our necks. It was not until nightfall that we again found Earl's body, with only one finger peeking out of the snow. We had gone in circles all day, searching desperately in our memories for clues as to his whereabouts. When we did find him, Ricky took out a bright red rag and hung it from a tree branch. Should we need to return to that spot later and find Earl completely submerged, though we'd cleared the snow around his naked body. We then headed east as we knew they could not be south, as we'd just come from that direction nor west, as that was where the cabin was, and to the north where the plains in the frozen pond. The snow whipped out our faces as we blundered through the snow, and the deeper into the woods we went, the more skeletal and twisted the trees became, seeming to become frightful figures leering at us, plotting our demise. The terrain grew hilly, but though our feet were worn and sore, we persisted, fueled by blinding rage. It was late into the night when we found the wolf's den. It was nestled under an overhang on the side of a hill, with roots spreading their fingers over the walls and floor of the enclave, with bones and carcasses strewn about. At first, I took them to be shadows in the dark, but Mason was the one that noticed their oddity. Are... are they sleeping? He stammered. I squinted my eyes and shook my head. Believe so, Ricky whispered. They should be hunting right now. That's odd. I lowered my gun and tested the branch of a nearby tree. I don't give a flying dang, I growled as I began my ascent up the tree. I'm going to kill every last one of them, if that's the last thing I do. They agreed and took positions in opposite trees so that we circled the sleeping wolves. I told them to wait for me to take the first shot and to keep shooting after the cue. I sighed and tried to relax my shoulders, but to no avail. My blood was boiling, and my fingers were itching to spill blood. I lined up the scope and looked for the biggest one. There he was, right next to the bones of a rabbit. I fired. The silent air exploded with gunshots and yells and yelps as we fired at the unsuspecting beasts, their blood staining the crystalline snow. We killed about three of them and wounded two others, though they escaped deeper into the hills along with one other who left uninjured. Easy. When we eased to the den to inspect the damage, Ricky gave a short gasp of surprise and inspected the walls of the inlet. 
the smell of flesh pungent. You guys see this? There's drawings on the walls. We shined our flashlight to meet his and saw what appeared to be Native American symbols and drawings written upon the walls of the earth, depicting crude interpretations of owls, wolves, and other animals I wasn't quite sure the nature of, that would seem to be feline in nature. Looking up, I saw that there were feathers and other decorative trinkets hanging from the ceiling. Thought nobody lived out here. I breathed. I tore one of the trinkets off and inspected it. Talons from what appeared to be an owl. I threw them down and left the den without a word, heading in the direction the wolves had escaped. None of us said anything as we searched for the wolves. We seemed to be perfectly tuned in to each other as we traipsed the night. The sky glowed redder than ever casting angry hues over the land. I thought it odd that this phenomenon should be occurring so frequently, but my mind was elsewhere. I wanted only to kill these beasts. We eventually, after a grueling struggle through the snow, which was picking up despite the skies being clear, found the first of the injured wolves, whimpering and licking its wounds. We killed it, and found the next wolf, an older cub not far ahead. It was as we were searching for the third wolf, the one who escaped uninjured, that we felt it. It was subtle at first, but soon there was kind of an electric static in the air, making our hair frizz and cling to our faces. The red sky blackened with clouds, and the snowfall grew into a blizzard. We had not been speaking before, but now we didn't dare to. We could all feel it. An owl cried from above, and I saw what looked to be a mangy animal slipping off into the bushes, yellow eyes glaring at us for a few moments before disappearing. Was that a cougar? Ricky hissed under his breath. I nodded, and he swallowed. Thought they were supposed to be further east, Mason mumbled. I put my finger to my lips and scanned the trees around us. Though the snow was heavier than ever, I felt as though we were in the eye of a storm. We waited. We waited for an eternity in that windy silence. We knew not what we waited for, but we knew whatever it was. It was something to be feared. Mason had moved to make a run for it, but I grabbed him by the shoulder, not wanting to alert whatever it was with our presence, and the off chance it didn't know exactly where we were. Perhaps ten minutes had gone by, us planted into the cold ground, eyes raw and wet when we heard the beasts. They howled. No roared from nearby, a deafening bellow that demanded flesh, and it came from all around us. Ricky bolted, racing faster than I could ever imagine him running back the way we came. Mason was on his tail, and I knew that I had better follow suit. I could hear them trampling in the snow behind us, monstrous beasts snarling and stampeding after us. Blood pumped and rang in my ears, but my legs were numb, and I was perpetually urging them onwards praying hard that they not tremble or slip. The snow to the sides of us erupted, and I could see shadowy behemoths racing alongside, though I could not get a good look at them, nor did I try. My eyes were focused ahead, and my mind was fitted with a single purpose, to flee. They bellowed and howled, their noises ungodly and bone-shattering. Ahead I could see the den with the dead wolves, as though in slow motion, Reggie tripped over one of the carcasses, and screamed. But neither I or Mason paused in our tracks. We could not afford a moment's hesitation, lest those shadowy beasts come upon us, and we left Ricky behind. The sounds of his screams and breaking bones followed our ears, until they ended with a ghostly suddenness. I don't know how we managed to get back to the cabin. The creatures could have killed us with ease at any point in the race home, but I did not care for the sight of the cabin felt like a godsend, and Mason and I barreled through the door and locked it tight. The moment we came inside, the air grew silent again, and the static seemed to disappear. Without a word, we went to the other doors and locked them, and then closed the shutters on all the windows in the house. Mason threw some of the heavy furniture in front of the doors while I relit the fire, eager to get rid of the cold biting at my flesh. What the F just happened? Mason croaked. What were those things? I don't know, but we need to leave as soon as possible. Though we should probably wait until morning. I don't want to go out there again while it's still dark. Mason agreed and we packed our things, 
after which we sat by the fire with our rifles in our laps and pistols loaded on the coffee table. We listened intently to the night, not daring to sleep. At one point, Mason began to doze off, but I made him and myself coffee to open our eyes. Around three in the morning, we were jolted by a din of screeching metal from outside. Fearing the worst, we ran upstairs and peered out the window. Mason cleared the frost from the window and cursed under his breath. What? What is it? Just come look. Nervously, I approached the window and peered out towards the truck. Oh, great. From what I could tell, the front of it had been ripped up with shredded metal protruding like gnarled teeth. I scanned the area for beasts, but could see nothing. Not even tracks in the snow. Should we go out now or wait until morning? He asked, his eyes scanning the other windows rapidly. Definitely morning, I answered. I didn't want either of us to end up like Earl or Ricky. Mason nodded his head and we went back downstairs and escaped to the warmth of the fire. When morning came, we grabbed our guns and went upstairs to check through the windows whether or not the coast was clear. Fortunately, it appeared as such, though we were still light on our feet as we headed outside to inspect the damage to the truck, while the red lights in the sky still flickered under the sun. Ah, heck, Mason cried. They ripped up the whole dang engine. It was true. The screeching metal we'd heard that night had indeed been the creatures ripping through the hood of the car and mauling the engine beyond any hopes of repair. The metal sliced through as though it was butter. Mason stomped over to the side of the truck and groaned. They took out the effing tires too. What? Yeah, come here and look. I walked over to him and screamed and bashing the palm of my hand against the side door. How in the F could they know to slash the engine and tires? I yelled. Mason shook his head and ran his fingers through his hair. Only got one spare in the back. Besides, no way we could fix that engine. He turned his head towards the trays. What is it? I asked, my voice hushed. I suddenly became aware of the sensation that we were being watched. He scanned the woods with his eyes. Let's just go back inside. We were quiet for the rest of the day, conversing and whispering and throwing hectic glances to the doors and windows, even though the shutters were closed and bolted tight. It was that night, too, when we heard the howling begin, if you could call it that. The moans were deep and hollow, yet full of fury and lament. They were unlike anything we'd ever heard, and kept us on edge as though we might slip out the door by accident and be devoured by those things, while the makeshift Christmas tree in the corner mocked us silently with its naive cheerfulness. Not having a good night's rest two nights in a row, I went upstairs after the howling began, hoping that sleep would be my sanctuary. It was as I was about to change out of my clothes when I first noticed the shadows on the ice, tucked away behind the trees. They were darker than the night and seemed to be weaved in and out of existence, merging and dispersing as though to avoid my eyes under the soft red glow of the northern lights. They were monstrous in size, too, though I could distinctly tell that they were not in the shape of any large creatures local to this area. I snuck back downstairs and whispered for Mason to follow me back up and pointed out the shapes. Don't like the look of those things, he mumbled. Don't look natural, like they're not even made of anything. Goodness, they, they must be as big as a horse, eh? I smiled grimly. We ought to keep watch, I said. Take turns so we can get some rest. Well, I'll take first watch then. Don't think I want to know what my dreams will be like tonight. I checked my watch. It's only six. Want to do three hour shifts and wake me up at nine? He nodded and went back downstairs. Neither of us heard anything save the howling, though around midnight, right as I was about to go back to sleep after my turn to stay up, the air became quiet and stayed that way for the rest of the night. Mason was wrapping his fingers on the kitchen table when I came downstairs around nine, having awoken of my own accord. Anything new? I yawned. He stared at my closed window as though he could see the scenery beyond. You there? They did it again, Tuck. What do you mean? I asked. His face was still pointed at the window. They're playing with us. How so? 
He looked at me and I could see his eyes were raw. I went out to the icebox by the woodshed after the sun came up. We were low on food, and I needed to see if any of the meat was still fresh. And? It's all gone. The door's ripped off and all the meat is gone. Every last bit. So we're stuck with a few granola bars and coffee, because thanks to our wonderful foresight, we ate more than we planned. My throat felt dry. How much do we have left? I asked. Probably enough for two days between the two of us. We're planning on eating the game for dinner, but guess that didn't go so well. All we've got are the snacks we brought. We'll have to ration this. Guess that we can get snow from the front porch for water. During the day, that is. I opened the pantry and counted a box of Pop-Tarts, five granola bars, and half a box of Ricky's cookies. Gosh dang it, Ricky, and his food Santa BS, I hissed under my breath. I mean, we're all supposed to be leaving tomorrow anyways. Well, it doesn't look like that'll happen anytime soon. I slammed the pantry shut and pounded my fist against the table. I swear, if Ricky was here right now, I'd wring his fat neck. Mason nodded and pulled out a can of dip, which I recognized to be Earl's. Give me a pinch of that, I demanded. Mason dumped a small lump in my hand and I stuck it in my mouth, a habit I'd quit the year prior. I thought hard. Guess we can still hunt some of the small game. They don't seem to come out in the daylight. Mason's eyes widened and he jerked his head vigorously. Heck no. I'm not sitting foot back out there if I can help it, he said. Just going to the woodshed, I could feel that. That feeling from the other night. Like the air sticky. Felt their eyes all over me. Well, we've got to have food, I returned. Uh-uh. Not taking a step out that door so as long as I can help it. Well, I'm not going back out there alone. His eyes grew heavy and he hung his head. Tomorrow, he sighed. We'll go out tomorrow. I just... I just need to prepare myself. Let's just eat what we've still got today. I reached for a cup and spat into it, eyeing Mason down heavily. His eyes darted between my own and the floor. All right, fine. We'll hunt tomorrow. Catch some rabbit. Maybe some bird. Cook it up right away. Just keep doing that until somebody comes looking. He nodded his head and hurried past me, going upstairs where he remained for the rest of the day. Out of both contempt and grief for the loss of Reggie, I grabbed his Santa hat and grabbed a beer from the last case. Warm as piss. Psh, food Santa. I grumbled later as I sipped on my eighth beer in a row. Dumb guy, I'll show that fool what a food Santa really is. Stumbling, I rose from the chair and grabbed the rifle and loaded it. I'd... I don't care what the heck Mason says. I want meat, I growled. Might catch a rabbit. Keep him. Keep him as a pet. Name him Earl. Might keep another, a fat one. Name that one Ricky. I shambled over to the door and pulled on my coat, still drunkenly grumbling nonsense to myself. But the moment I opened the door, I was smacked in the face by a whirlwind of blinding snow and that tension in the air. That same kind of static tension that we'd felt when they took Ricky. I tried to ignore it and took a step forward, my foot landing on something soft and squishy. It was Ricky's head. I screamed and fell backwards into the house, scrambling to shut the door. For a moment, I thought I saw yellow eyes glaring at me from the trees. Mason! I cried, dragging myself back away from the door. Mason, get down here! It's Ricky! What? Ricky? I heard him fly down the stairs and saw his hand next to mine, offering to help me up. Where is he? I blinked and gagged. Outside the door. Wait, no, don't, don't open it. It's not him, it's, it's his head. The dame things left it for us. Mason ignoring my warning, he flung open the door and screamed just as I had. Oh my gosh, you could have told me that instead of saying he was here. My bad, I hiccuped and doubled over. You're pissed, aren't you? I slowly nodded my head. He huffed and said, all right, just come upstairs and get some sleep. He put his arm around me and dragged me up the stairs my boots thudding against the panels, softened by snow and blood. When I came to, night had already fallen, and the howling had begun. Closer this time. Mason sat at the desk next to the window, reading from his book on Native American legends. They're still at it, I croaked. He jumped a little and nodded, putting down the book. They're closer, he whispered. 
look. I got up and went over to the window, the cold almost snapping my toes in half. Outside, the snow blew hard against the icy glass, but through it, I could see the dark shapes again, though they were now at the edge of the trees, circling around the house. One of them slipped into the moonlight, and I caught a momentary glimpse of it. It was a wolf. It was the biggest dang wolf I'd ever seen, and as Mason had said, it must have been as big as a horse. Its head was flat and its back was sloped down like a coyote's, yet the fur was a silvery shade of gray that seemed to glow against the snow and under the crimson moonlight. But in the shadows, they grew dark and obscure. Their movements were just as slippery as before, one moment being in eyesight and the next having seemed to merge into the shadows. Between the howling, I would occasionally see one bark and yelp at another of the giant beasts, as though speaking to one another. What the heck do you think that thing is? I asked. Don't know. I'm trying to look in here for anything. I looked behind me and he raised the book to me. To heck with that nonsense. I say they're a bunch of dang werewolves. His eyebrows flickered, though I could not tell if they did so out of doubt or fear. I, I know it sounds crazy, I hurried. But what else could they be? They're freaking huge. And they're smart too. New to take out the truck, new to take the meat, and look at it. They're talking to each other. He gulped. Used to have nightmares about werewolves. He chuckled though his eyes were wide. I mean, I guess it's the only thing that makes sense. You think there's any silver or anything? Any crosses? Maybe wolfsbane? Might be a cross or two somewhere, but I doubt there's any silver. What we need are silver bullets, but we sure as heck don't have any of those in here. And the only dang things edible we have anymore are some piddly old granola bars and cookies. Definitely no plants. The window rattled with the wind, causing us both to jump. You think we could shoot him from up here? He asked. I looked back to the window. Nah, snow's too thick. Can't see them but for a second or two. He slumped in his chair. Crap. I agree. I spent the next hour scrounging around the house, but all I could find was the silverware and an old Bible, none of which I had any clue as for what to do with besides set them next to the doors. I didn't sleep for the whole night, though once the howling stopped at sunrise, my eyes allowed themselves to rest. It was later in the morning that Mason woke me up, clutching the book in his hand. Tuck, I think I know what they are and I don't think they're werewolves. Well, what are they then? I mumbled. My eyes itched and felt swollen from the lack of sleep, and my tongue felt like cotton. Mason opened up the book and furrowed his brows. Uh, they're called Wahila. They're supposed to be large wolves with flat heads, though it says here that they're much smaller than the ones outside, and they have light fur. It says that they're from Northwest Territories, but I guess we're far enough north, some could be down here too. I don't give a crap about all that, I snapped. Skip to the important part. He shot me a glare, but continued on. They bite people's heads off, Tuck. They bite them clean off your body. A chill ran down my spine as my heart began to beat faster. They bite heads off? Yeah, I mean while you're asleep. I just got to thinking about them being werewolves and, and thought it didn't make much sense. I mean, it hasn't been a full moon for these many nights in a row. And where would they live when they were in human forms? Nobody's around here for probably another 10 or more clicks down the road. Does it say how to kill them? No. And I don't know if guns work or not. Well, we'll just have to find out when we can see them better, I guess. So what are we gonna do? I laughed, F it if I know, lay low? The corners of his mouth twitched upwards, though only momentarily. We spent the day doing absolutely nothing, as we'd been doing, and though our stomachs rumbled and growled, neither of us had the heart to step outside, away from the safety of the wooden walls of the cabin. We'd run out of firewood too and resorted to hacking apart the Christmas tree to keep the fumes alight, while gray tracks in the snow circled the cabin outside. When night came, and the howls seemed to bellow in our very ears and the beast drum ever closer, Mason offered to stay up through the night, since I had stayed up the previous night. 
I did so while the banging shutters and the rustling trees fueled my dreams. I awoke to gunshots. Spiraling instinctively in the bedsheets, I grasped at the nightstand and steadied myself, whipping my head about. My eyes finally rested on Mason standing in front of the open window with the rifle pointed down below while snow blasted onto our faces and across the floor. What the F are you doing? I gasped. I'm trying to kill these things. They're closer. He fired another round, the snow causing my ears to ring in the confined bedroom. Snow's too thick, need to get a better view. Mason closed the window and reached for the door. I scrambled to my feet and quickly pulled on my coat and boots. You're not going out there, are you? I asked. He flung open the door, allowing it to crack against the wall. Yup. You're effing crazy, they're gonna rip your head off. He ignored me and I raced down the stairs after him. He'd already moved the china cabinet out of the way from the front door, but I wedged myself desperately between him and it. But before I could say anything, Mason pointed the rifle at my head, his eyes dead and stony. Get the heck out of my way, Tuck, before I take your head off. Mason, don't be a fool. They'll kill you the moment you step outside that door. So what? They'd kill us anyhow, only a matter of time. You hear the wind? That's the sound of death, marching right up to our doorstep. We can try to make it out of here. We'll leave in the morning. They don't like daylight, remember? We'll make a run for it. He gripped the rifle tighter and worked his jaw. You really think they're scared of the sun? They put Ricky's head on the doorstep in the day, didn't they? Cause it sure as heck wasn't out there when I found the meat gone. They wouldn't give a ding about the time. They're not going to let us leave. And if I'm going to die, then I'm going to take as many of them as I can with me. You can hole up in here and draw it out, or you can come with me. Sweat trickled down my forehead as he glared at me, the gun still pointed at my brain. I said nothing. With a jerk, he raised the gun and fired it just above my head, and pointed it back down at me again. Get the heck out of my way, he snarled. I stepped aside and allowed him to go outside to the front porch, quickly slamming the door shut behind him, and dragging the china cabinet in front of it. I'm not letting you back in, I hollered. You know that, right? I don't want in anyways. I heard the first gunshot, followed by another. I raced upstairs to the window, grabbing the rifle by my bed. But by the time I cocked it and pointed it out the window, his headless body was already being dragged back to the trees. I fired twice at the wolf dragging him away, and while I was certain both shots had met their target, the creature was unfazed. The night was silent after that, with only the sounds of the wind and the crackling fire to be my company. I didn't dare look back out the window and instead sat in the chair, tapping my foot and twitching my fingers. My mind was numb as I listened to the air and replayed the events of the past two weeks in my mind on a loop. The back of my neck prickled as the static encroached upon the house. When I saw the first rays of the morning sunlight struggling to wiggle their way through the shutters, I eased my way upstairs, not wishing to disturb the electric silence. I made my way to the window to see that the sky was clear and red, and that Mason's naked body had been dragged back out in front of the cabin, covered in blood and feces. His head was nowhere to be seen. I quickly shut the window again and went downstairs to throw the last of the Christmas tree into the fire, complete with a star made of eggnog containers. I caved into my hunger and ate the last of the food. The remainder of the days was spent much in the same way as I'd spent the night, though I found myself being unable to sit still in the chair as the static in the air grew in intensity, making my ears ring like sirens. Every sound seemed cataclysmic and every breath felt as though it were my last. When the night returned once more, so did the wolves. Their paws grazing mere feet away from the door, growling and crying at me, deafening the relatively peaceful silence. I tried to fire at them again with the rifle, but the snow and the cold were at the worst they had been yet, and I could scarcely see their silhouettes below. Though I think even if the night were clear, I would have only seen the bullets do nothing. Knowing that there was nothing more I could do except wait, it was then that I began to write this, in both the hopes that somebody finds it, as well as simply a means to keep my mind somewhat sane while death waits not 20 feet away. I was surprised to find myself still alive this morning, 
though night has come yet again. I fear this is the last, for they've grown ever so closer, scratching and pawing at the walls. They do not speak. I think they want me to hear that they have come. I can't even see them outside as the roof overhangs them. I've piled all the furniture downstairs in front of the doors, and I'm now locked in the bathroom, where I have similarly barricaded the doors with the beds and the desk as I write this upon the floor, with the last candle nearly gone. Just now, I heard the sound of splintering wood. I think it was the door. I have my pistol trained at the door with my left hand while I write this with my right. I know it seems foolish to do so, but, but it is the only way I can escape this horror in the slightest. It feels more like a story than reality within these pages. The furniture is being dragged away from the door, the low grumbling of wood on wood shaking the floor, innumerable claws slowly and methodically scraping and clacking, while the low breath of these giants grow ever closer. They're climbing the stairs, and now they've paused right outside the The Accident Last month, something very strange happened. My four friends and I went to the local haunted area for a scare and to kill an evening. It was about 9pm, so it was as dark as it was going to get for the night. We were arriving at the spot when it started to get extremely foggy, to the point where you could hardly see in front of you. Definitely a scene for a scary evening. We started to slow down to park and I saw a look of terror on my friend's face. A look of terror that no one else can fake. He then said, Accelerate, in a tone that both intrigued and terrified me at the same time. Without really thinking, I just sped up about 10 miles per hour faster than I had been going, just assuming that the spot we were in scared him a bit. As we went further up the road, the restlessness that he felt only proceeded to get worse. At this point, I just wanted to get out of where we were, as his fear was beginning to rub off on me. As I continued to pick up speed, I saw what had scared him so badly. I had only seen it for a split second before I heard the crunches and felt the car go over a bump that no one else would want to acknowledge, but was impossible to ignore. I panicked in a way that I'd never had before, and stopped the car with such force that we all jerked forward into what was in front of us. Ignoring the pain with adrenaline and shock, we all got out to inspect what my fear and carelessness had done, and after seeing what was there, I wish I just kept driving. The man was laying in a pool of blood, his chest flattened from one line of wheels, and his feet flattened from the other line. It was a sight that I knew would stick in my mind as well as my friends for as long as we should live. After the disgust and horror we all witnessed, I convinced everyone to get back into the car. Once we all got into the car, the weather had completely cleared, as if the tension in the area had been relieved. I had no choice but to take all of my friends home with the scars that I knew would haunt them for the rest of their lives. On the way home, no one spoke of the gore that we had just witnessed, and I had no problem with that. I felt like there had been a presence following us, but I just brushed it off as shock and went on with my driving. I dropped off all of my friends, making the promise that the events would never be spoken of to anyone. I then made my way to my house to cleanse my car of the horror that it had endured. I hosed the tires and bumper off, and then went inside the house to take a shower. I still had a feeling of a presence, which had begun to give me a very unsettling feeling in the pit of my stomach, but I knew that it was just guilt. Guilt is the mind's form of karmic retribution. No one can completely get away with something. I went to bed once I got out of the shower, hoping that I could sleep with this terrible night of existence. It took only two hours for me to finally fall asleep, but that would be the worst mistake of my life. I woke about three hours later to the worst sight of my life, and at the foot of my bed I saw the face of my accident. Sitting no more than two feet away from me was the personification of fear. His body was mangled. His chest was flattened along with the lower half of his legs. He sensed me being awake through my fear and turned to look at me. He had no eyes, but the sockets showed all the pain and anger that he felt. 
This was coupled, however, with a sick sense of amusement that he got from the control that he had over my sanity. He lunged for me, getting within mere inches of my face. Even though he had no eyes, I still felt as though he could see right through my very light of existence. He then whispered in a tone of pure terror, Forever, and crawled out of my room. I ran out of my house into my car and drove. I drove for six hours straight, well into the daytime. I don't know what that creature was, but I do know that he will forever be with me, as a constant reminder of how fear and panic can ruin one's life. The Kushtaka My name is Kevin Wilson. I only thought it was right to write about what had happened to me and my family. Before my incident, I was very logical and a skeptical man. I didn't believe in Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, or anything in that nature. They were just silly bedtime stories that my mother used to tell me. Nowadays, I'm not sure what to believe. When I close my eyes, I can see her. Anyway, before I get too ahead of myself, I should probably start at the beginning, back before I met those things. My wife Monica and I lived in Reno, Nevada for basically our whole lives. When my wife got pregnant, I was so happy. All my life, I had wanted to be a father and teach my child how to grow up in the world. I can still remember the day that my son was born. He was so small and fragile, and I was so happy that my dream finally was coming true. Of course, I was happy for Monica as well, giving birth to our beautiful child, Tilby. A few years after Toby's birth, Monica and I started talking about moving. We wanted to get out of the city and desert and find a nice small community where we could raise our son. We searched for weeks, hundreds of cities and every state that didn't have a desert in it. Finally, after weeks of searching for the perfect city, Monica found the city of Juneau. It was the capital of Alaska, and yet it only had about 30,000 people in it. We checked our budget and came to the conclusion that we would move to Juneau. When the plane landed in Juneau, it was raining. Not heavily raining, mind you, just drizzling more or less. We were told by some locals that it rains quite a bit in Juneau. We didn't mind that, though. We just wanted out of the big city stress and clutter. We had already made plans on renting a house and getting interviews for jobs before we moved up there, just to be in the safe side. We took a cab and started our way to our house, which was in part of Juneau they called Douglas. We had to cross a bridge to get to Douglas, which we learned from the cab driver was a large island next to mainland Juneau. He dropped us off in front of our house, and what a view we had of the water. We were on the beachfront, and we had our own stretch of beach where we could go straight into the water. It was very beautiful, and we had thought that we had made the right choice for everyone. As we settled into our new house, I remember glancing outside and seeing an animal floating in the water, staring towards our house. I knew nothing about animals, but I thought I should take a picture of it, to symbolize that this was our good luck symbol. By the time I had gotten the camera and came back to the window, it was gone. I didn't know it at the time, but the animal I had seen was an otter. That night, I was awoken by a strange noise coming from the beach. I got out of bed and looked out the window to see dark silhouettes running on all fours. I managed to grab a camera and snap a few photos of the things, and I went back to bed. The next morning, I showed my Monica and Toby the pictures of the animals. They were amazed at the animals, and Monica thought that, whatever they were, that they were cute. When I went to work, I showed some of my coworkers the pictures, and one of them blurted out, Oh, those would be sea otters playing on your property. I remember asking if they were dangerous, and he replied, Only if provoked or unlashed, it's a kushtaka. Everyone but me laughed at what seemed to be a joke that went straight over my head. Don't make fun of them. The new voice startled me, and I spun around to see who it was. It was a man who appeared to be an Alaskan native. The others sighed and went back to work, except for me. I wanted to know what a kushtaka was. I asked why you shouldn't make fun of them, and he replied with a classic, You're not from around here, are you? I shook my head since there was no sense in lying. Well, he replied, 
Kushtaka is a Tlingit, which means otter people. They are known for shapeshifters and for killing and eating humans. I went home that day thinking about how stupid that had sounded. Shapeshifting human otters. What a joke that was. A few nights later, I was in the living room watching TV while Monica went to go drop Toby off at a friend's house for a sleepover. As I sat there, I heard a sort of scratching coming from the back door. I got up to go look, and as I reached for the handle, I heard the sound of a baby crying on the other side. I froze as the sound made my hair stand up on end. The crying was coming from just outside the door, where I just heard the scratching noise. I wasn't skeptical as I said before, but for a brief instance, every horror movie I'd ever watched had come back to me. I shook the feeling off and opened the door. I looked down and staring at me with bright green eyes was an otter. That was very concerning for me, considering there was no baby there. I stared at it for a few seconds before I tried to nudge it away with my shoe. As I touched it, it hissed at me and swiped at me, taking a good chunk of skin with it. I yelped in pain and the otter scurried back to the water. I sat down holding my wound as it dripped blood onto the hardwood floor and looked up to witness the otter standing on two legs, looking back at me. It gave me an eerie human-like grin, showing its sharp teeth and licked his claws. I don't know if my heart had ever beat that hard before, but I can say that honestly, I had never been that scared for my life before. I quickly got up and slammed the door shut and locked all the doors and windows. When Monica got home, I told her what had happened and showed her my wound. She took me to the hospital and she continuously tried to convince me that I was just in shock and imagined the whole thing. I know what I saw though, and I didn't know how to explain it to her without sounding crazy. After getting a series of rabies and tetanus shots, we went home. As we walked to the front door, we could see that the house was trashed, furniture torn up and scattered everywhere, dishes shattered and everything else in between. As Monica called 911, I noticed that the back door was wide open. It had large claw marks running down it. When the authorities arrived, they told us that it looked like a bear had gotten in. I told them that I locked the back door and they responded with, Huh, that's strange behavior for a bear then. We cleaned up the mess when the authorities left and we went to bed. It took me a long time to sleep because with every creak of the house, I was reminded of that smile the otter gave me and it lapping my blood from its claws. Weeks after that had happened, I was at the table eating breakfast with Monica. Toby then came downstairs rubbing his eyes and looked at us. I will never forget the words he said next. He looked right at me and said, The otter people told me last night they wanted to kill me. My heart sank at hearing those words, and every time I think about that day and what he said, Anyways, after he said that, Monica blamed me for filling his head with scary stories. She and I drove Toby to school and argued the rest of the way home about whose fault it was for what Toby had said. That night, I couldn't sleep very well. The thought of what Toby said and Monica and I fighting. I was a little on edge and restless, so I thought I'd go sit in the chair in the living room. I sat down and stared to doze off, right as I heard a baby crying like before. I sat up confused and then became scared for Toby. I got up and ran to his room to check on him. I opened the door to his room and froze in utter fear. Standing over his bed was something ungodly hideous. It had the body of an otter standing only five feet tall. Its hands were like those of humans, but it had large curved claws instead of fingernails. Its face was that of a half otter, half man with the same crooked smile. It stared into my eyes with its hypnotic eyes and turned slowly towards me. I shook myself out of my trance and looked at it only to feel its sharp claws enter my shoulder and its heavy body pouncing on me, knocking me to the ground. It let out a piercing screech as it leapt off my body and ran for the door. I lay on the ground holding my bleeding shoulder as a loud shatter echoed through the house, followed by the sound of Toby sobbing uncontrollably. I blacked out. I woke up in the hospital with a bandage around my arm and a few tubes sticking out of me. I looked around the room and saw Monica and Toby sitting next to me. Monica leaned down and kissed me softly and Toby hugged me. I was overjoyed to find out that they were safe. 
I actually cried. The doctor told me that by my wounds it looked like I was attacked by a bear. I argued, of course, because I knew that I was not attacked by a bear. It was one of those kushtaka things. But as I tried to plead my case to them, they told me that I must have dreamt what I saw. I could not believe that no one was listening to what I was saying. I know that it most definitely sounded like I imagined it, but it was still the truth. I stayed at the hospital for a few nights longer to fully recover. My last night there, I had a weird dream. I was underwater, swimming in the rain. I popped up above the surface of the water and was staring at my house. I turned my head and glanced at what looked like four other otters surrounding me, and nodded. We all then began to swim towards my house. I woke up in an absolute panic and looked outside as the rain pounded against my window. I had to get out of here and go check up on my family immediately. I got dressed and since I was on the first floor of the hospital, jumped out the window. I ran as fast as I could, hoping that it was all nothing more than just a dream, and I would find them sleeping in their beds. As I got to the front steps of my house, I collapsed on the welcome mat, gasping for air. I was soaked down to the bone and my lungs felt like they were being crushed. As I regained my strength, I opened the front door slowly and was greeted with the darkness of my house. I tried the lights, but they did not turn on. I gulped and stepped inside further, noticing the slight breeze coming through the house. I could see the back door was wide open. My heart beated faster and I walked towards my family's room. As I walked closer, my vision had trouble adjusting to the pitch blackness that surrounded me. Suddenly, I stepped inside something that squished under the weight of my foot and slipped out from under me. I landed on my back and immediately gasped as the air was knocked out of me. I laid there for a few seconds before I looked to see what tripped me up. Lying on the ground next to me was a body with its entrails ripped out, limbs torn off and face skinned. I stared in horror, for even though this person was virtually unrecognizable, I knew that this was my Monica. I turned away from it, not wanting to look at that abomination. Tears fell down my face and reality slowly started to sink in. After a few minutes, I heard a scream coming from outside. It was Toby. I got up quickly, shaking off the pain rushing down my back and heart. I sprinted out the back door to the beachhead. I stopped as I looked into the green eyes of the Kushtaka. It was grinning crookedly as it held Toby by his hair. Toby screamed and kicked, trying to get away from this thing's clutches. I cursed at it. Let my son go! Take me instead! The Kushtaka smiled more, showing his sharp teeth as he did. It acted like my pleas for mercy entertained it. It held Toby up further and put his hand under him, holding him like a child. It slowly started to pet his hair as it spoke in a cracked, dry voice. No matter what has or will ever happen in my life, I will never forget that awful voice and what it said. It stared into my eyes and said, No, I enjoy this too much. With those words, it pulled Toby's head back and sank its teeth into my son's neck. I screamed and watched in horror as it tore my son's neck out and then threw him at me. Toby landed on the ground with a thump, and I watched him die in front of me. The Kushtaka laughed and dove into the water, swimming into the black water. After the cops cleaned up the mess and I was released after being questioned for murdering my family, I flew back down to Reno so I could be away from the ocean. I will always remember everything that happened while we were up there, and I will never forget those things that lurked in the oceans. Because of the Kushtaka, I will never go anywhere near the ocean again. I cannot sleep in the dark anymore, and every time I hear a baby's cry, I am reminded of those green eyes and that horrible smile. The thing that I will remember most of all of that will be that voice and what it said to me. No, I enjoy this too much. <laughs>